Hey there, I'm Charlie Comstock with Model Railroad Hobbyist Magazine. I'm here with Nick Muff. Nick has got this Kansas City Southern layout downstairs in his house, and it's a very unusual layout. In fact, we have to uh, take quite a walk to get through it. He's got a uh, a passenger car down there, and we're going to hike through that, and he's got a bit of a station down here. You can hear some of the sound effects in the background. Nick, uh, where did you, uh, you know, you live in northwestern Washington. How did you get started with Kansas City Southern? Well, short story is my grandparents lived in northwest Arkansas. So we travel from southern California, where we live, to Kansas City and down to Arkansas each summer to visit my grandparents. Of course, it allowed me to see trains that I didn't see in southern California, particularly the Kansas City Southern. Okay. So uh, you want to show us what you got here? Sure, I'd be glad to. Okay, Welcome. let's go. All right. Well, my real love is the passenger trains and passenger train travel. So here in the basement, I've recreated in full scale and in an HO scale an experience in passenger train travel. The lobby here simulates the midway at Kansas City Union Station. And uh, to the left is the entrance to the Pullman car. To the right here is what looks like part of the side of an F unit. And uh, the, pneumate, new, the pneumatic door operates. And this represents the mock-up of a Pullman car. People ask where I got it. I built it. I tell them that everything that's in this car, I carried down those stairs. So come on in. So there's a roomette, a museum, restroom. Let's come on in here and see the museum with Miss Southern Bell standing on the left. And like all passenger trains, it's cramped around the corner here and down the hall is the buffet lounge and again this is all uh, a mock-up probably about one-third the length of a real passenger car and like all model railroaders do, it's been selectively compressed so that uh, it recreates the feeling of being in a passenger car, even only it's only one third as long as one. And the table setting here, that's Kansas City Southern's Roxbury pattern china and Kansas City Southern flatware and hollowware on the table. And come on through this way, through the door, is the layout room. Hobos jokingly referred to box cars as side door Pullmans. This is a real side door Pullman. And out here we're in the layout room. To the left here is the passenger car. And then the locomotive. As opposed to the passenger car, the locomotive is not a mock-up, it's the real thing. And then across the room from right to left is Kansas City, downtown in the late 40s, early 50s. Nick, uh, would you tell me about this station here? So, well, this is the uh, centerpiece of the layout, Charlie. It's Kansas City Union Station, again, as it might have appeared in the mm -hmm. late 40s or early 50s. And it's a monument by model railroad standards. It's six feet wide, four feet deep, and all put together, it weighs 80 pounds. Yikes. Most of that weight is in the castings, the two-part resin castings that are in there. Mm -hmm. And what people don't generally realize, unless I tell them, it's not full scale. I realized right at the start 
that within the confines of a 30 by 40 foot basement, I couldn't make it full scale. There just isn't enough room. What would full scale have been? Well, you know, it would be 20% larger than it is now. Uh, so if I put it the other way around, I build it at 80% scale. Even at that, it dwarfs trains and buses and people. And so uh, it, it's effective and it looks right and uh, managed fit as it is the throat Mm -hmm. One end of the layout to the other, 40 feet in this room is just long enough to go throat to throat for the Union Station. <laughs> You've got uh, more than one or two uh, lights in here. Yes, there's almost a thousand LEDs in it. I haven't really counted them all, but in the, in the main chandeliers in the waiting room, there's 82 LEDs in each of the three chandeliers, so there's over 200 LEDs just in the three chandeliers. Well, it's pretty bright in there. It's bright, it's nice. I, you know, the, I see the, the original architect did a good job with lighting that interior. Uh, there's wall sconces around the edge, so there's lighting in the center, lighting around the edge, which provides re a very even lighting. And I like to tell people that the great majority of little railroad station modelers bill would fit in the Grand Lobby. In fact, our Pomeranian will fit in the Grand Lobby. Have so you tried that? I've tried that, yes. <laughs> and how did the, how did the Pomeranian oh, take it? Oh, he's fine. He never knows what's going on anyway, yeah. Okay. So, so. Yeah. How did you get the lights in the cars? Well, you know, uh, those are micro LEDs. I think they call them surface mount LEDs. They're 0.3 by 0.2 millimeters. And you can buy them with leads attached, or you can put your own leads on. I've done that. It's a little tedious. The main thing is uh, I would not have attempted to put all the lights in the cars and the trucks were it not for the availability of LEDs. Incandescent bulbs are going to burn out eventually, even if only 10% of them burned out. That would be a disaster. And so they're tiny little LEDs on a tiny little, I call them Nats Whiskers wires. You drill a hole, bring them out the bottom, put resistors under there. Getting back to the station, uh, did you get plans for this from somewhere? Well, that would be nice. In fact, I actually know where the plans are now. I didn't know then. Mm -hmm. But so I called, <laughs> I wrote the Kansas City Terminal Railway and asked if they had plans. That was kind of bold. This is a long time ago. And uh, they said, yeah, they did. So I went back there and I met with a gentleman in this room right here. Where's that? Right here. Okay. Unfortunately, when I came in, he was asleep at his desk. So I had to kind of wait there and hem and haw for a while. And finally he woke up. And what he provided me was a very nice um, front elevation in 8th inch scale and an elevation of the waiting room only the side view in 16th inch scale and one other piece of paper that I didn't realize the value of at first. It was just, it listed the elevation of the roof, the ceiling, the mezzanine, everything uh, from top to bottom. Of course, that turned out to be very valuable in scaling the model. Mm -hmm. And that is when I realized I was going to have to learn how to do CAD drawings. And so I used a CAD program to use what I did have and then slides and photographs to create what I didn't have to produce all the interior and exterior plans for the station. Okay. Now, what's the station made from? Uh, in real life or the model? Well, the model. The model is made from, you know, I tell people all the flat surfaces you see, that's eighth inch sheet styrene. And eighth I, inch. Eighth inch, yes. That's pretty thick. Well, it is, but I need stability and strength. If you, for instance, the floor of the Union Station is eighth inch. All these heavy castings, you know, they have, they're actually screwed to that with little screws from the bottom. It has really? To, it has to be screwed pretty stable. Yeah, you know, tiny recessed screws. I went down to Cadillac Plastics and I buy it by the four by eight sheet. So the well, that's the only way to buy plastic. Well, yeah, for this it is. For the Union Station, at the driveway. And the Railway Express building consumed three 4 by 8 sheets of 8th inch styrene plastic. Yikes. Then all the other pieces here, uh, the complex pieces, the masters were built primarily out of styrene plastic. Uh, then I made RTV rubber molds and used two-part uh, casting resin to pour the copies. Mm -hmm. one, one mold for one column, and then that turned out to be a total of... 12 columns, and so forth. Okay. What about the built parts of the building here on the side? Is there anything you had to do there for construction? Well, actually, yes. And, and I, I learned something which was very helpful. This was the issue right here. These corners are highly visible. So if I had made castings and tried to miter those with a saw 
and sandpaper and try to get it right. I can imagine that being a real nightmare and it's got to look good. It's right here where it's very visible. So what I did is I uh, created the U-shaped master uh -huh. and I used high density blue styrofoam to make a block that filled that just a block that fit in the back of the U and made it a solid piece. And then I made the RTV rubber mold and pulled the whole thing out. Then I pour resin in the mold and put the styrofoam block back in. Now I checked with Joel Bragdon, who's my expert on this, um, to make sure that the resin would not attack the styrofoam, which it doesn't. So then it was set. I pull everything out of the mold. I pull the styrofoam block out of the back and I have a U-shaped casting. And so the joints, I don't have to miter the joints, they're, all, they're already made. And that led me to be bold enough that on these corner pieces here, uh, I cast all four sides at once in one piece. The roof and all four sides are cast in one piece. There's a styrofoam block in the center that you pull out. And so that meant that I didn't have to miter any of these corners after the model was after the molds were poured. Mm -hmm. This is a separate piece. It's hollow. You can actually see light through the little windows. It had a styrofoam block in it. And then the only other trick is these columns are separately cast and applied. Now to get that out of the mold, you have to split one side of the mold. So you take a scalpel and split one side of the mold so it can open up. You can take the casting out, then you tape it back together for the next casting. That turned out to be an immense help and saved me all the fussy trying to miter those corners. Mm -hmm. Now, what you see isn't what all what you get here. Like an iceberg, uh, you're seeing the top part of the building That's here. That's true. So you actually modeled some of the basement areas too. I did, you know, and, and when you're crazy, you're just crazy. And so I thought, right, well, you well, know. Show us how crazy. Yeah, I wanted people to appreciate, number one, that there was more of the station underground and above ground and, and how efficiently it was built so that all of the baggage handling went on underground where you weren't aware of it. And so this panel on the front has a little description of the station, how much it cost, when it was built. Then when you open this panel, you're seeing now the, the plaza or street level, the basement level, which is where local baggage and express was handled and the sub-basement where through baggage and express were handled. So the, here is a little baggage, lighted baggage truck with the parcels in it. Also down at this level is where the mail was delivered. It came from across the street, down the length of the express building, under here, all on a conveyor belt. And a conveyor belt had automated flappers that would divert the mail where it was supposed to go. So there's little carts under Atlanta, Denver, Los Angeles, and then those carts went out underground through a tunnel to the end of the platform and there was an elevator at each platform so that there was no trucking of baggage at platform level at all. It all went down, everything happened underground and you never saw it. Mm -hmm. Of course, by separating through baggage and express from local baggage and express, it made sure that they didn't get mixed up. That if you were headed for Kansas City, your bag didn't accidentally go on to New York. Mm -hmm. What year were you modeling here? So. I, I had to pick a year, 1951. 1951, mm -hmm. yes. Okay. So this is pretty much what would have been going on in 1951. It is, yes, that's correct. Station. That's correct, yes. Okay. So well, I like to have animations on the layout. Um, okay. Well, visitors really are interested in those things. Mm -hmm. And But I want real, uh, realistic animations. So a kite on the end of a piece of music wire that goes around and around isn't going to work for me. Okay. And so first animation on this end of the layout is this little Rock Island switcher. Number are, one. Aren't right. you afraid it's going to come off the end of the trestle? Well, we've arranged so it doesn't, actually. There is a diode in here that blocks this section of track, so it can only run so far, and it will stop automatically. The same on the other end when it gets in behind the buildings where it's hidden. And the other thing is this simulates the Rock Island crossing simulates another railroad. Actually, there isn't any Rock Island Railroad except for three feet of it right here. Okay. But every once in a while, in fact, every three minutes, that little switcher comes in and out with that a load of coal for Kansas City power and light. And of course, it's fun to see 
how many people think it actually is going to run off the end of the trestle. I set it as close as I could and be on the safe side. You have uh, people uh, make diving grabs yeah. for it? Yeah. Hey, your train's running. Yeah, and they're trying to get over there to catch it. Of course, it stops about three quarters of an inch from the end of the trestle. So next animation here is a hobo campsite. Actually, the model was built by a friend of mine when he was just a teenager. I've replaced the fireplace electronics with something a little more modern so it gives a very nice effect. One of the things that's easy to do is this little wisp of cotton here that simulates smoke. There isn't very much of it. It's surprising what an effect it creates. One nice thing is to have buttons that visitors can operate on the edge of the layout and so there's a button here that says hear the lonesome hobo call. So you push that and And although you can buy circuits that'll do that, some of them are relatively expensive. What drives this particular circuit is the insides of a greeting card. The greeting cards that you open and they play a song. Well, somebody gave me one that played the Wabash Cannonball. So I took the little electronics out of it, put it under the layout, hooked a push button up, but it was too soft. And so went down to the thrift store, got a speaker set for a computer with a little amplifier in it, hook that up and, and that's what makes that work. Next effect is this blast furnace inside Sheffield Steel. And the interesting thing about that is that uh, it's created using an, a, a transistor radio. You disconnect the speaker leads, connect them to a red light bulb, and the advantage of that is it provides a random effect. Creating a random effect with electronics is a little bit of a challenge but you tune the AM radio to a uh, static, and it's the static that drives the flickering light. And action. This is Kansas City Iron and Scrap Metal. Animation here is this little pillar crane. That's an Alexander Scale Models Kit, and although those have been around for a long time, detailed and weathered, it looks really nice on the layout. Uh, again, it's a realistic animation. It's something that would happen in real life. The visitors are always surprised when the crane starts to move. These scrap piles, uh, I wanted them realistic, so I think the only way to get this to look like individual pieces is to use individual pieces. And so underneath this is crumpled tin foil. I use Rust-Oleum's Ruddy, Ruddy Red Primer, I think that's the correct name, uh, for this iron color. I sprayed the tin foil that color. I kept all these scrap pieces from projects, put them in a box, sprayed them iron color, shook them up till they were all coated, and then glued them on, starting with the largest, least detail pieces first, and working up to these medium-sized pieces, and then saving the finest detailed tiny pieces to put on top. Then I went around with a little grimy black here and there, a little uh, silver paint here and there, and then came back with uh, black and rust powdered chalk colors to create that effect. So on the left side of Union Station, here is powerhouse number one. And in that, I stole, installed a Sooth smoke generator. The power plant was originally coal burning, hence the tall smokestack. And so to animate that, I put a smoke generator in. This roof lifts off, and you can see there's a plug in socket that connect that to the power plant so if anything goes wrong with it you can just simply lift it off and replace a little smoke generator inside. So where I grew up in California near Knott's Berry Farm there was one of the famous copper tone signs and it was an animated sign so no one I know of makes this sign in HO scale or any scale so I thought wouldn't it be fun to recreate the sign and considering it's only one and eighth of an inch thick, wouldn't it be neat if I could find a way to animate it like the one that I grew up with? And so there's a little motor down inside the building which animates the sign. The sign is on sheet brass. The dog in the swimsuit are on thin sheet brass. And at the pivot points where her hand are, 
and the dog's backside is are tiny pieces of brass tubing and there is a hairpin shaped piece of brass that bends across the front of the sign and the back of the sign. On the front of the sign it supports the swimsuit and the dog and on the back side of the sign there's a little wire with a loop in it that moves those wires up and down and creates the animation. When I grew up I always enjoyed the animated industrial signs and so I've incorporated a number of them on the layout. One of this one of them is this commercially available sign for Arctic refrigeration. As the sign changes, the words come on, the thermometer goes down, the ice forms, and then it says, we take the heat out. <laughs> Nick, we're standing in front of an F7 cab. That's correct. Or actually, the, you know, the, whole, the whole front end of an F7. That's it. So what on earth were you thinking of to have this thing brought How did you do it? How did you get this into your basement? Well, what I was thinking of a long time ago uh, in Model Railroader, there was an article on building sort of a half-scale throttle uh, and brake stand, which I, as a kid I thought that was really cool. And so then a friend asked me if I wanted to buy a Kansas City Southern NW2 control stand. He said, I know you usually collect paper, that's a little big. I said, sure. So I bought that and restored it. And then I wanted a road unit throttle. You know, switcher throttle, they, uh, it's just like your car, the accelerator goes from zero to 100% just by moving it. Whereas on a road locomotive, they have those eight discrete notches, which allows uh, uh, the prime movers to come up together. So I got a hold of the scrapyard in Tacoma and asked them if I could buy a throttle and a brake stand uh, and a dash and a chair and uh, I said sure so I went down there and uh, went around the scrapyard and well the throttle was $75 and the brake stand was $25 and the chair was $25 and the dash was $15 and then he said well what are you trying to do mock up the cab of a diesel locomotive and I said yes he says, well, we're going to cut up the 682, BN 682. Um, I'll sell that to you for the same total that I just quoted you, which was a few hundreds of dollars, plus $35 an hour for the torch cutting, since they couldn't just blow it away like they usually did. And the honest truth is, inside my head, a little thing said, you're crazy. Really? Yeah. No, I mean, what would you do with it? How would you get it home? Where would you put it? And then I got to thinking, well, you know, so if you cut off the nose and cut the cab in half, so I just have the engineer's side, which is what I was trying to do to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, that's, let's see, eight feet by five feet. Put a giant mirror there. That'd be weird. You'd see yourself. But anyway, that's doable. So I went back and I told him, I'll take the engineer's side. He said, oh, man, the fireman's side, we just cut it up for scrap. Make Toyotas out of it. I'll just give it to you. I mean, there's nothing in it of value. You can just have it. I thought, oh, okay, now we're talking 10 by 8 feet. And then bless my dear supportive wife's heart. On the way home, she said, well, what will happen to the nose? I said, don't cut it up, make Toyotas out of it. She said, well, can you stand to see that happening? That's the nicest part of the whole locomotive. So that's how we ended up with the cab. But from Tacoma to up here north of Seattle, that's a bit of a trip. And I don't think you just—I don't think you just took this and walked down the stairs in the basement with no, it. No, uh, you know, and so there, there lies a tale because, yes, I still had it cut into three pieces. I had the nose cut off. I had the cab cut in two halves. That allow us to haul it on a U-Haul trailer that we could rent for nineteen dollars a day for two days, versus a commercial trucker since it's an overwidth load at t at uh, ten feet. I didn't know how much that cost. I didn't want to find out how much that cost. And so it came home in three pieces, just like I'd originally intended. And uh, I bolted it together. Uh, what did you fill the seams with? Squad well, green? I didn't fill them right away. Oh, okay. It sat in the backyard, and in the backyard we sandblasted it. Filthy job. And we repainted it and restored it. And, of course, then when it came time to dig the basement, it was sitting right on top of where we would dig the basement. So you didn't already have a basement? No. Had to move it alongside the garage so we could dig the hole for the basement. 
So we uh, dug the basement, they laid up the concrete block, poured the cement, and then, uh, well, it's, we have a church member who owns a trust company, and he was very gracious to come out all three times with his truss crane and move the cab around. And so the final time we set it in the basement, uh, there's a tube steel frame under it, which allows it to rock back and forth. And ultimately, I had it welded back together. That was a command decision. I was going to just bolt it, body putty it. But if you're going to rock it back and forth, seams are going to open up, fiberglass is going to be popping out. That's not good. Mm -hmm. So I call my friendly welder, and they welded it back together down here in the basement. And then I body puttied it and sanded it and repainted it down here in the basement. Now, this cab is operational, isn't it? Obviously, you don't have the prime movers behind it anymore. <laughs> yeah. But uh, the headlight here works. Yes, the, the uh, defroster fans, the heater fans. In fact, uh, one engineer who used to run F units said, wow, this is a lot different than the ones I used to work in. And I'm thinking, well, you know, I try to be really accurate. And I said, how so? He said, the things in it work. <laughs> Well, there you have it. Thank <laughs> you. 